Tell us about the impacts you've seen from COVID-19 on your business so far and really how you're modeling the year ahead. Yeah, we're very happy about the performance of the first half. We have shown great resilience in manufacturing, and of course, we've had numerous challenges all over the world, but our manufacturing organization has really risen to the task, and we have been able to keep on supplying. As you know, we're the world's biggest supplier of uh, medication. We supply around 200 million patients every day. And the pattern we really saw, we saw some shifts in demand patterns. We had extraordinary high demand in Europe in the first quarter, basically in March when people started hoarding at the pharmacy level, uh, OTC products, generic products, and so on. And then we saw a reversal in the second quarter, where during the lockdown, people went less to the doctor, people went less to the hospital, less to the pharmacy. So when we look at it over the whole first half, we see a stabilization of earnings. And then because we've been improving our manufacturing and become more efficient, we see an improvement in overall earnings. So that part looks really good. Now we're in a phase where nobody really knows where the pandemic is going in the next half year. What we see is a pattern where in Europe, people tend to go back to doctors, people tend to go back to pharmacies. There's a normalization of the situation. In the US, we still see demand being a little less than what I would call normal uh, demand. And uh, we hope that the volume demand will come back, but we are planning for both scenarios, both a scenario where volume demand comes back and also a scenario where well, there'll be some maybe 5, 10% less demand in the second half of this year. And in both cases, we think we know how to operate, how to control our cost, and how to ensure that our supply chain remains intact and we can supply the many millions of patients we supply every day. Mm. Well, I want to ask you also about the issue of drug shortages. Of course, the pandemic increased demand for certain medicines, you know, hydroxychloroquine being one of them listed on the shortages list uh, from Teva and other manufacturers. That, of course, has become a political drug uh, and has not lived up to the hope uh, for being very helpful for COVID-19. Uh, but it is an important drug for other diseases. What can you tell us about your ability to manufacture enough of these drugs that have come under such strain uh, from COVID-19 demand? Yeah, so it is, of course, a com complicated situation. We saw a lot of drugs where uh, I would call it repurposing was being pursued. So you take an existing drug, and then because the pandemic is so se serious and severe, you simply try different drugs to see if they might work. And uh, you have to think about the fact that normally when a drug is developed, you have 10 years of clinical development that clarifies when and how does the drug work in the best possible way. Here, people are trying to do this in 10 weeks, maybe. And that's a very difficult task. And therefore, it's been difficult to get clarity on which drugs will actually work, when will they work, when in the disease progression, are they effective, are they preventive, should they be used at this point or another point in the disease progression. So we've been trying to work with governments and healthcare systems worldwide. We've been making donations in more than 25 countries. And we've been focusing on the drugs that were being asked for. And then, of course, that pattern has changed Rightly, as you said, hydroxychloroquine was very much in demand early on. Now we still see demand, but it's less. And we try to make sure that we allocate products so that all patients who really need it can get it. Also, the existing indications in the U.S. And uh, as far as I'm aware right now, we don't have a shortage for patients who need it for their normal daily chronic uh, therapies.